Hey, my name's Abraham Ojeda, and ever since I became a born-again Christian about 15 years ago now, I have been trying to understand Bible prophecy. But it wasn't until the crazy events of the year 2020 that my eyes were finally opened to what the Bible truly actually tells us about the time of the end that we're living in right now. But before we get into it, you really should know that I never wanted to be one of those end times guys. I was professionally trained as a chemist, and even though Bible prophecy has always interested me, I always felt like it was a place that was a dead end street. It seems like everybody has their own twist, their own interpretation, and it always seemed to me that we could never really know what the Bible was telling us about end times, and I kind of just left it at that. But after I received the message that I'm now going to share with you today, uh, it became my moral obligation to now share freely what I have received from Jesus himself, I can now freely share with you also. And it really all has to do with Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. God tells us that he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. That's exactly why I direct your attention to Genesis chapter 6. It's right around the time of the flood. The flood waters are about to overtake the entire earth. All flesh is about to perish. And it's within this context of the Nephilim running around on earth, the wickedness of man growing so great that the Most High God actually tells us that something very profound, and it is the most overlooked, misrepresented, butchered, and downright ignored verses of the entire Bible, but it's actually just as important as the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy and the entire book of Revelation for understanding end times. So this is what the Most High already told us a long time ago. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Genesis 6.3 so I have a huge question for you. How many people do you personally know that have lived to be 120 years old? When I first investigated the topic of longevity, I was really big into fitness, dietary supplements, and nutrition. I even worked as an analytical chemist, professionally testing and studying specific supplement formulations that focused on living longer, like Niagen and BioPQQ. In my journey to better understand human nutrition, I came across the Blue Zone Diet and information related to the whole idea of Blue Zones. Here's what an article from Interesting Engineering has to say. Blue Zones are areas of the earth where people live the longest, often reaching well beyond 100 years of age. Compare that to 73.4 years, which was the worldwide average life expectancy in 2019, according to The Who. In other words, these blue zone people are the gold standard of health and wellness worldwide. They are beating the statistics for longevity. They are outliers of healthy human aging. And if you go to www.bluezones.com, you will find even more information about what makes these places unique and why they live so long. But even these people don't live to be 120 years old on average. They only live to be a little over 100. In my pursuit of getting to the bottom of this rabbit hole, I really wanted to know whether or not this scripture is literally referring to a person's lifespan. So I researched the oldest people in the world that have been recorded in recent history. With medical advancements, life extension technologies, and advancements in supplementation, surely people were hitting the 120 year mark, right? According to the Gerontology Research Group, GRG, an organization that verifies and catalogs the oldest people in the modern world, the oldest living person at the time of the writing of this book is Maria Brañas Morera from the U.S. at 115 years old. The vast majority of the people documented on this site range from 110 to 115 years old. Only a few outliers have lived beyond this range, and at the time of writing, only eight people are confirmed to be alive that classify as super centenarians, the oldest people in the world, with an average age of 114. Let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. 
Every single one of these people on the GRG website are extreme outliers in a world of 8 billion people. If Genesis 6-3 were really speaking of someone's lifespan, then people living to 120 would not be the wildly rare exception, but the norm. I had been aware of this reality for the longest time, yet I never properly questioned Genesis 6-3. It always remained a complete mystery to me. What was it possibly talking about? Let's take a closer look at this verse, but pay attention to the words in bold. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Genesis 6.3 I'm about to present a real challenge to you, but first, does the Bible contradict itself? Well, do you remember one of our golden rules from chapter 1? The Bible is absolute truth, and there are no errors, just as we are told by the prophet Samuel. Moreover, the eternal glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. 1 Samuel 15 verse 29 TLV Okay, so then how is this following verse I'll show you also true? Is there a contradiction? Of course not, as I'll show you. The span of our years is 70, or with strength, 80, yet at best they are trouble and sorrow. Psalm 90 verse 10 TLV for the untrained and unskilled with the Word of God, which, sadly, is the vast majority of people, there's no logical explanation when comparing Genesis 6-3 with Psalms 90 verse 10. Except that the Bible contradicts itself. <laughs> in one passage, it is translated to say that the lifespan of man is 120 years, but in another place it says that 80 years is as good as it gets for those who have a strong will to live. Whenever there is an apparent contradiction in the scriptures, it is never the scriptures that are false, but it is our lack of understanding that leads us to believe false things about the scriptures. Like I have said before, every cult and mystery Babylon religion is guilty of committing the grave error of misinterpreting the Bible at least once. Let's not fool ourselves any longer. Nobody lives to be 120 years old, it is extremely rare, and only certain people that live in the unique blue zone areas of the world live to be just a little over 100, but these are not typical cases. Now let's go back to the interesting engineering article that I cited earlier. The author mentions that even the World Health Organization 2019 statistics show that 73.4 years used to be the average lifespan. I say used to be in the past tense because this was before the COVID pandemic, vaccine agenda, and all of the artificial problems of today. Pre-2020 was the peak of modern civilization in terms of convenience, abundance, and quality of life. I'll show you exactly why life will never be the same beginning from March 2020 onward as we continue unpacking the secrets of biblical prophecy together. Let's take a look at it one more time. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Genesis 6, 3, NKJV. It turns out that this Hebrew word, shane, Strong's H8141, has been mistranslated into English as years. It should not say years, it should say divisions of time or revolutions of time, just as the Strong's Concordance has laid out so clearly. Here's how I would translate this verse. And Yehovah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 periods of time. The next logical questions you should have are, well, what are these periods of time? How long are they? When I first started digging into this massive gold mine, I had to start by asking the question, what if? What if these periods of time are also specifically within Leviticus, right there in the pages of the Torah? Well, Elohim has made his secret counsel known to us. It's now time for us to look at Leviticus 25 from the Tree of Life version. Pay attention to the words in bold. Then Adonai said to Moses on Mount Sinai, Speak to Bnei Yisrael and tell them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land is to keep a Shabbat to Adonai. For six years you may sow your field, and for six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there is to be a Shabbat rest for the land, a Shabbat to Adonai. You are not to sow your field or prune your vineyard. You are not to reap what grows by itself during your harvest, 
nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. It is to be a year of Shabbat rest for the land. Whatever the Shabbat of the land produces will be food for yourself, for your servant, for your maidservant, for your hired worker, and for the outsider dwelling among you. Even for your livestock and for the animals that are in your land, all its increase will be enough food. You are to count off seven Shabbatot of years, seven times seven years, so that the time is seven Shabbatot of years, 49 years. Then, on the tenth day of the seventh month, on Yom Kippur, you are to sound a shofar blast. You are to sound the shofar all throughout your land. You are to make the fiftieth year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It is to be a jubilee to you when each of you is to return to his own property, and each of you is to return to his family. That fiftieth year will be your jubilee. You are not to sow or reap that which grows by itself, or gather from the untended vines. Since it is a jubilee, it is to be holy to you. You will eat from its increase out of the field. Now if you ask, what are we to eat during the seventh year if, see, we are not to sow nor gather in our increase? Now I will command my blessing to you in the sixth year, so that it will yield a harvest sufficient for three years. When you sow during the eighth year, you will still be eating the old stored harvest until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. Leviticus 25 verses 1 through 12 and verses 20 through 22. Tree of Life Version. Do you see it? 7 times 7 equals 49. This passage reveals how we are supposed to count the years of history from a solely biblical standpoint. And what is spoken here is radically different from any modern method of historical timekeeping, including the Gregorian calendar that we are so accustomed to. The key words here are that you are to count so that the time is seven Shabbatot of years, 49 years in Leviticus 25, 8. Understanding this major concept of seven sabbatical years in a 49-year cycle is critical to keeping track of time, God's way. We are commanded to count by 49-year periods. Notice something extremely important. We are not commanded to count by 50-year cycles. We are told to acknowledge the 50th year as the year of Jubilee, but we are not actually told to count by 50-year cycles. We are commanded to count only by 49-year cycles. Let me paint this picture using a simple diagram because I find that these sorts of illustrations help immensely. This pattern of counting by sevens is present from the creation week in Genesis chapter 1. We all count seven days in a week and not eight, and this same concept is true when we are talking about the 49-year cycles of history. The 50th year of Jubilee is the same thing as year number one in the very next 49-year cycle, just like the eighth day would actually be the first day of the next week. I don't mean to belabor the point here, but the false interpretation of counting by 50-year cycles has been pushed by a growing number of voices and ministries out there, and as a result, many people are being led astray into completely fraudulent interpretations of scripture and very misguided understandings of end times events. So, now that we understand we're supposed to count by 49s, let's go ahead and do the math. 120 times 49 equals 5,880 years. Yes, what I am saying is that the entire history of man as we know it will only last for 5,880 years. Based on this information alone, you can now create an Excel, Numbers, or OpenOffice spreadsheet and begin the process of data entry as follows. Shawnee cycle number 1, 1 through 49. Shawnee cycle number 2, 50 through 98, Shawnee cycle number 3, 99 through 147, and onward until you reach Shawnee cycle number 120, 5832 through 5880. All of this work has already been done for you in the back of this book. See Appendix A. What I will now show to you is how we can properly connect these ambiguous creation years to our everyday Gregorian years of BC and AD to unlock the Daniel prophecy and also see exactly where we are in the modern day context, 
The first thing we need to do is simply look at the genealogical records of the Bible and start adding up the years to see how everything fits. Again, the only reason we are adding up all of these numbers is because this is how we establish a connection to Gregorian years so that we can understand exactly where we are in the entire 120 Shanae of mankind. This next exercise is really easy. Just grab your Bible because all of the information you need to figure out the math is right there. Note, I am going to be using the KJV because of its accuracy in following the Masoretic text as I go through the following biblical chronology. If you need help counting it all, I recommend using the chart in an article from Wikipedia entitled Genealogies of Genesis. This encyclopedia entry provides a nice overview of the chronological records of Genesis, but use the Hebrew Masoretic and Latin Vulgate texts for determining the years because the other sources are inaccurate. All you do is add up the ages of the fathers when they have their firstborn sons in order to figure out the total number of years. Genesis chapter 5 gives us all the years from Adam to Noah's son Shem. The book of Jasher notes that Noah was 502 years old when he begat Shem, but you can also calculate his age based on the birth year of Shem's son, Arphaxad. Genesis chapter 11 brings us from Shem to the birth of Abraham. You will get 1,948 years. This is an undisputed fact. The problems and disagreements start to happen among scholars, teachers, and Bible students after this point in time. The major problem is that we simply cannot keep going forward in time by continuing to add up the ages of the fathers when they have their firstborn sons. Just try it and you'll see the problems. Yes, we can add up Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and many sons of the tribes. Eventually, you will arrive at the books of the Judges, Samuel, and the Kings and will be unable to continue because we are not given every single firstborn son of a particular lineage in order to determine a chronology. Getting to the times of the New Testament and the modern time period we are now living in becomes problematic at this point. It even seems impossible. And even though Matthew 1 verse 17 provides for us the generations of Yeshua's lineage, it doesn't actually give us exact years that we can decisively use for our chronology. Thankfully, there's a secret time clock hiding in plain sight for all those with spiritual eyes to see it. And this secret time clock has everything to do with what we already read in Leviticus 25. But before we get to that, Let's navigate this tricky section of the chronology from Abraham to the Exodus. I will do my best to keep this section concise and simple to understand using diagrams. Genesis 12.4 tells us that Abraham was 75 years old when he left his homeland of Haran in order to follow Yehovah and be obedient to his voice. Three chapters later in Genesis 15:18, we see the exact moment in history where Yehovah cuts a covenant with Abraham. This particular day is profound from both a chronological and prophetic standpoint. A deep sleep fell upon Abraham after he had slain the sacrifices of the covenant and the flaming torch passed between the sacrificial pieces in order to confirm the oath between the Most High and Abraham, along with his descendants. At this point, we need to pause and look at what Paul said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now to Abraham and his seed were promises made. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed. Galatians 3 verses 16 and 17 and KJV. What Paul is telling us is that the law, as given from Mount Sinai, came 430 years after this particular moment in history when Abraham fell into a deep sleep and the covenant promise was given to him. Keep that in mind as we move forward because it will serve as one witness of the chronology that I am going to unpack for you. Let's now take a look back at these words from Genesis 15:13. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. We are given yet another number. Yehovah says that Abraham's descendants are to be mistreated in a land not their own for 400 years. We are also going to use this number alongside the 430 years that Paul told us about to prove the correct chronology. 
Now remember, we left off with the 1,948 years from Adam to Abraham. We are told in Genesis 21.5 that Isaac is born when Abraham is 100 years old. Simply add this number to 1,948 to arrive at 2,048 years after creation. Remember, these are not Gregorian years. So now what? How do we connect this information to the 400 or the 430 years? How do we continue moving forward in time? Well, we have to answer two questions. Number one, what was the moment in time when Abraham received the covenant promise? What was the creation year? How old was Abraham? And number two, when exactly was the start date that Abraham's descendants were mistreated in a land not their own? Did this begin in Egypt under the harsh treatment of the pharaohs, or was it sooner? Let's begin with the first question. We can figure out Abraham's age by understanding the timeline from Ishmael being born through Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian handmaid. Remember, the covenant promise was given in chapter 15. In the very next chapter, we are told in Genesis 16.3 that after Abraham had been dwelling 10 years in the land of Canaan, he decides to go ahead and listen to Sarah and have intimate relations with Hagar in order to bear children. Because we were already told that Abraham was 75 when he left his homeland of Haran, he was 85 when he took Hagar as a wife. Hagar conceives and gives birth to Ishmael in Genesis 16:16, 16, 16, and we are told explicitly in the text that Abraham is 86 years old. Therefore, Abraham was between 75 and 85 years old when the covenant promise was given to him in Genesis 15, verse 18. If the details seem a little overwhelming at this point, don't worry. I'll show you a chart in a moment. Let's now address the second question. The prophecy of Abraham's descendants being mistreated actually begins with Isaac, as I will prove to you in a moment. It is Genesis chapter 21 that gives us the account of Isaac growing up and becoming weaned, and it is the day that Isaac is weaned that Abraham throws a great feast. Isaac was in fact weaned, Abraham threw a great feast that day, and then at some point later in the future, we see this take place. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Genesis 21, verse 9. The word here for scoffing is Strong's H6711 and can mean to mock, to make sport, or make a toy of. When the Philistines gouged Samson's eyes out, threw him in prison, and then later summoned him for personal entertainment, Judges 16 verse 25 uses the same Hebrew word where it says, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. Another time this word is used is in the account of Genesis chapter 39 verses 14 through 17 where Potiphar's wife tries to frame Joseph as if Joseph is trying to have sex with her. She says, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. Genesis thirty-nine fourteen. Even though this Hebrew word could also mean to simply laugh, something bigger and more problematic than laughing is going on here in Genesis 21, 9, because Abraham was greatly displeased with what happened, and God himself even tells him that it's okay to send Hagar and Ishmael away from Isaac. When I think of this account and what happened, my mind goes to Proverbs 17, 17, which states, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Genesis 21, 9 could be talking about physical violence, an act of sexual perversion, or even harsh words. The bottom line is that this event of Ishmael mocking Isaac actually begins the counting of the 400 years of mistreatment in a foreign land. And the 430 year count from the time of the covenant begins when Abraham is between 75 and 85 years old. Here's how this information all fits together on a chart, and I will prove to you that this is the correct interpretation as we move forward to the time of Joshua. What I am going to show you is that Abraham was 80 years old when the covenant was made. If we use the number that Paul gave us from the covenant to the law at Sinai, then the math works out to be exactly 2,458 for the year of the exodus from Egypt. 
I am also going to prove to you that Isaac was actually 10 years old when he was mistreated by Ishmael, and when we add 400 years to this starting point of mistreatment, we will also arrive at the year 2458 for the Exodus when this period of time is over. Our assumption is that the year for the Exodus is 2458. Now, we simply have to figure out the order of events from the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy, and finally, when the nation of Israel enters the Promised Land in Joshua 5. What many academic works and various chronologists fail to realize is the fact that the nation of Israel began traveling to the Promised Land in the second year after the Exodus, meaning that they were at Sinai for about two years. We are explicitly told this fact in Numbers 10.11. Now it came to pass on the twentieth day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of the testimony. Of course, we know the sad ending to the story. The people complained for meat. Miriam gets leprosy for questioning Moses' leadership. We then arrive at the scene of the twelve spies being sent out in Numbers 13 at the command of Yehovah. Of the twelve spies that are sent out, only two bring a good report, but the other ten bring a report that causes extreme anxiety among the people. We read that the people wept all night and determined in their hearts to select a leader to return back to Egypt. Numbers 14 verses 1 through 4. It is this staunch rebellion that causes Yehovah to swear this oath in Numbers 14.34. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt, one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. The decree from the throne was that Israel would wander for 40 years. Once this time period was over, the following event happens, which is extremely important for decoding Genesis 6-3 and the 120 periods of time. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Joshua 5 verses 10 through 12. We are told that the manna ceases. The children of Israel enter the promised land, and they eat the food of this land starting on the 15th day of the first month, Aviv, of the Hebrew calendar. The words of immense importance are that they ate the food of the land. By implication, they did not plant or sow this food. Of course, they couldn't have possibly farmed the land because they had just entered the land. The crops that they were eating were planted and tended to by the Canaanites. This fact may seem trivial, except that we were given this specific prophetic declaration in the Leviticus 25.2 before this event took place. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. We already looked at this verse earlier in this chapter, but now it's time to dig a little deeper. The question we need to be asking ourselves is, what kind of land Sabbath is Leviticus 25.2 talking about? Recall that God keeps time in cycles of 49 years. After every six years, there is a land Sabbath on the seventh year. After the 48th year in a 49-year cycle, there is the, a 49th year Sabbath, of course, but it is immediately followed by the 50th year of Jubilee, which is also a land Sabbath. So, which is it? Are we talking about one out of the six seventh years in a cycle, the 49th year, or the 50th year in Joshua 5.10? What I am about to mathematically prove to you is that the children of Israel entered the promised land exactly on a jubilee year. It wasn't simply one of the seventh years in a cycle, or even the 49th year, but it was in fact the 50th year of Jubilee in a cycle. The Jubilee is special. It is a proclamation of liberty in which everyone is supposed to return to the land of their possession. Leviticus 25.10 Just like other Sabbath years, sowing the land and the act of harvesting food for the purposes of storing up for long periods of time, as opposed to daily harvesting only, was prohibited. See Leviticus 25.11. Land, with exception of parcels within walled cities, 
was to be restored back to its original owner in the Jubilee year. See Leviticus 25, verse 28. Hired servants were also released Leviticus 25, 54, and therefore people were set free. It was a time of rejoicing and financial reset. The fact that Yehovah brought the people into the promised land on a jubilee year was highly significant. He, in his divine foreknowledge, already knew that the children of Israel would be faithless and wander for 40 years. He knew that the appointed time for the righteous Joshua generation to rise up and enter the land would be on the Jubilee when the captives return home and are set free. It is amazing when you step back and look at the bigger poetic picture and its significance. Here's how we know mathematically that this year was a Jubilee year. We take the year of the Exodus, which is 2,458 after creation. We add two years for when Israel leaves Mount Sinai, and we add the 40 years of punishment, and we get 2,500 years exactly. If the year 2,500 after creation is the 50th year of Jubilee, then that means that the year 2,499 is the 49th year of the Shane cycle. All we must do now is simply divide 2,499 by 49, and we should get an exact whole number with no decimals whatsoever. Then we will know for sure that we have interpreted the events of Joshua 5.10 perfectly. And in fact, when you do the math, here's what you get. 2,499 divided by 49 equals 51. Joshua 5.10 reveals to us that there have been exactly 51 Shane cycles in the entire history of the 120 Shane of mankind that were completed at this exact point in history. Now, we just need to figure out how to calculate the other 69 Shane cycles. The way we solve the mystery and get to the present day is by figuring out where all the remainder of the sabbatical, 7th or 49th, and Jubilee, 50th, years are throughout history. Here's the secret. We actually only need one accurate, verifiable event in history that occurred on a 7th, 49th, or 50th year in order to properly connect all of the creation years that we have calculated so far to the contemporary dating of Gregorian years. In other words, if we know that X event was a biblical year of land rest that occurred in the year XBC or ADX, then we can assign Gregorian years alongside creation years in a chart or a table and organize all of this information perfectly. A chart like this can easily be created inside of Excel, OpenOffice, or any spreadsheet software, and if you have the time and ability to do so, give it a shot. Let's just pause for a moment though. Do you realize the importance of what I'm saying? Once we know the Gregorian years for the creation year chronology we have developed so far using only the Bible, we can understand what the creation year 5880 is in the Gregorian years. We can therefore understand exactly when the 120 Shane cycles of mankind will end as recorded in Genesis 6-3. We will know the end of history. We will know the time of the end that was prophesied by Daniel, including the final 70th week of history. As we begin to look at outside sources throughout history to understand the Gregorian dating of the biblical years of land rest, always remember that a textbook Hebrew year occurs from Aviv to Aviv, just like we discussed in the last chapter. With that said, I will now provide you with 12 dates for the sabbatical years as documented and clearly presented within the book, The Sabbatical and Jubilee Cycle, Volume 1, by Kadesh LaYahweh Press. Here they are. The 7th and 49th years in history. 701 BC, destruction of Sennacherib's army outside of Jerusalem. 456 BC, the reading of the entire Torah, see Nehemiah chapter 7 and 8. 162 BC, the siege of Jerusalem by Antiochus Eupater. 134 BC, the murder of high priest Simon and the rise of John Hernanicus. 43 BC, decree by Gaius Julius Caesar. 36 BC, Herod's conquest of Jerusalem. 
22 BC, the 16th year of Herod's reign. AD 42, Jewish protest against Gaius Caligula Caesar. AD 56, a note of indebtedness in Nero's time. AD 70, conquest of Jerusalem by the Romans. AD 133, rental contracts during Bar Kokhba revolt. AD 140, Sabbath year Murabaat land deed document. This work is available to download for free, and I have included a link for you in the notes section of this book. These dates are backed by significant research of historical records, such as Antiquities of the Jews by the early historian Josephus, apocryphal works such as Maccabees, Esdras, etc., and many other ancient sources. The eye-opening discussions around the various errors that chronologists make when trying to figure out the correct numbering of sabbatical years also makes the Sabbath and Jubilee cycle well well worth the read. Remember, we only need one bulletproof Gregorian date in order to connect to the creation year's chronology. I will address which one of these dates is the most undisputed and accurate in a moment. In addition to these dates, Joseph Dumont has also done an extraordinary job in his independent research over the course of many years now in putting together a list of sources that shed light on the Gregorian datings of sabbatical years. His website details the discovery of the tombstones of Zoar. What we find in Zoar is fascinating, to say the least. This is a place outside of the land of Israel, south of the Dead Sea, in what would be considered the ancient territory of Moab. And it is here in Zoar that we find a community of Hebrews living after the time of the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Their tombstones are unique in that they have intact. Hebrew inscriptions on them with a glance at how these ancient Hebrews kept track of time. Dumont has even paid for the translation of some of these artifacts himself, and here is what his article, 45 Sabbatical Year Proofs with Documentation, says about one specific tombstone. Tombstone number 7, 427 CE, Naves number 5, published by Naves in 1987, painted red, it is missing the first three lines. The height preserved is 35 centimeters and it is 10 centimeters thick. This tombstone of X, son slash daughter of Y, who died on day Z of the sabbatical 26 days in the month of Nisan in the year of the Shemitah, year 3, 157 years to the destruction of the temple shalom shalom 357 plus 70 equals 427 common era these artifacts reveal many important truths first because these hebrews are referring back to the destruction of the temple which we know to be the sabbatical year of ad 70 we can assign a gregorian date to what the tombstones say in this example we also see that this person died in AD 427. They also inscribed on the stone that AD 427 was a Shemitah, which is the same thing as a sabbatical year. Do the math, and this year fits perfectly with all of the other dates from the chart I showed you, which is remarkable. What we are also seeing in these tombstones is that God's people have always been keeping track of time using sabbatical cycles or periods of 49 years, and they have also been diligent to keep track of when the seventh years of rest occurred throughout history in order to observe them. Now you see why Daniel's prophecy was sealed until the time of the end. This knowledge of keeping track of time, God's way, has mostly been lost from the consciousness of his people. And one of the purposes of this book is to help restore that consciousness. Because of this discovery, there are more dates that we can add to our list of known sabbatical years throughout history. I won't take the time to list them here, but leaning upon Dumont's investigative work, we can conclude that there are at least 23 more dates from the tombstones of Zoar that match the chronology of the sabbatical and jubilee years that I have already shown you in this book. One bulletproof Gregorian date. 
This one easy date that is the most verifiable and undisputed in history is 701 BC, which we can confirm with scripture and historical sources. Here's what 2 Kings 19 verse 29 says about this date. This shall be assigned to you. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from the same, also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's because it is a repetition of the same concept from Leviticus 25, specifically verses 21 and 22. Before we can discuss this sabbatical year, context is paramount. The prophet Isaiah was sent by Elohim to deliver this specific word to King Hezekiah of the southern kingdom of Judah. During this time period, King Sennacherib of Assyria was waging war against many nations and was the elite military power in the world right before Babylon rose to world domination. In fact, the Assyrians had just defeated the northern kingdom of Israel around 731 BC, approximately 30 years prior to the events of 2 Kings 19. Hezekiah found himself stressed out. He was afraid. But he cried out to Jehovah and asked to be delivered from the hand of Assyria, and his prayer was answered. Jehovah told him that he was going to be safe from Assyria and that he was going to give Hezekiah this particular sign. Scripture tells us that eventually 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are killed in one night by the angel of Jehovah. See 2 Kings 19.35, just as Isaiah had prophesied. See Isaiah chapter 37. Take a look at 2 Kings 19.29 again. We are told it is a sign. This is the same Hebrew word, Strong's H226, or oath, that is used in many places such as Exodus 31.13, in which the Sabbaths are to be a sign between God and his people. In other words, Jehovah tells Hezekiah that he is giving him the sign of the Sabbath to confirm his word that Judah would not be conquered by Assyria. Now, here's the verse again in light of this truth and also Leviticus 25. And pay attention to the fact that they are back-to-back -back Sabbath years of land rest. This is very unique. This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year, the 49th year, such as grows of itself, and in the second year, the 50th year, what springs from the same. Also in the third year, the 51st year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Based on various historical records, we can prove that 701 BC is this sabbatical year, 49th, and 700 BC is this jubilee year, 50th, spoken of in 2 Kings. In fact, it is universally accepted by scholars that 701 BC was the date of Sennacherib's failed invasion attempt of Judah. Edwin R. Thiel in his book, The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings, says, The date of 701 for the attack of Sennacherib in the 14th year of Hezekiah is a key point in my chronological pattern for Hebrew rulers. Full confidence can be placed in 701 as the 14th year of Hezekiah, and complete confidence can be placed in any other dates for Israel or Judah reckoned from that date in accord with the requirements of the numbers in Kings. The reason that Thiel and many others assert that 701 BC is a verifiable and bulletproof date in history is because of the overlap of historical records that can prove this date with a high degree of accuracy. For example, the combination of Sennacherib's annals, the Assyrian Limu, the Assyrian Eponym, and Ptolemy's Canon can all be used to pinpoint 701 BC as the year in which Sennacherib tries to attack Judah. These are records, cuneiform artifacts, and lists that provide detailed accounting of kings and events for that specific time period. For a deeper dive into 701 BC and its authenticity in the sabbatical years, make sure to read the Sabbath and Jubilee cycle in which the authors address Assyrian propaganda, common misconceptions, and other details surrounding this event. From Joshua to Hezekiah's 14th year. 
Now what do we do? We have the creation year 2499, which was the 49th year of the Shabuah cycle immediately before Joshua enters the promised land. We also have the Gregorian year 701 BC, which was the 49th year of the Shabuah cycle during Hezekiah's 29 year reign. How do we connect them? For the sake of clarity, Here's how we can pin the year 701 BC to a specific 49th year in our creation timeline. All we have to do is generally understand the timeline from Joshua, the judges, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, and the kings of Israel until we get to Hezekiah. Again, we must estimate because we don't know all of the years after Joshua enters the land. From Joshua to Hezekiah's 14th year. Joshua's conquest of Canaan, seven years. Elders that outlived Joshua, unknown. Judges period and Eli's judgeship, approximately 350 years. Samuel's judgeship between Eli and Saul, 12 years. Saul's reign, 20 years. David's reign, 40 years. Solomon's reign, 40 years. Rehoboam, 931 BC, to Hezekiah's 14th year, 701 BC, 230 years. The total number of years is approximately 699. My chart below was put together based on my own research along with the chronological research presented in Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings and also in A Biblical History of Israel. As I will explain in a moment, we can know the year of Solomon's death to be 931 BC, and since we know the timing and significance of 701 BC, we can understand that there are actually 230 years between these dates. Keep in mind that the years of the judges most likely overlap in different places and are ambiguous in and of themselves for establishing a timeline. Likewise, we don't know the exact years of the events of the book of Joshua, and therefore, my chart presents estimates. Remember, we are told in 2 Kings 18.13, that it was the 14th year of Hezekiah when Sennacherib foolishly attempts to attack Jerusalem in 701 BC. All we do is add up the number of years and you will get 699. We then pick up where we left off. 2,499 plus 699 equals 3,198 creation years. This year, 3,198, which is just a very rough estimate, tells us that we need to be looking somewhere around the 64th, 65th, and even the 66th Shane of mankind in order to connect 701 BC into our timeline. So, what did I just prove? My chart proves that, though we don't know all the dates from Joshua to the Judges, we can reasonably estimate we get actually really close, and what I will more clearly demonstrate to you in just a moment is that we can declare 701 BC to be the year 3136 after creation. This is absolutely the only way the math works. 5,880, the final Gregorian year from Aviv 2044 to Aviv 2045. We can now go back in time and have a complete list of dates for the sabbatical years and the 120 Shanae of mankind as prophesied by Moses. At the end of this book, in Appendix A, you will find my spreadsheet that has been constructed based on all this information. You should review it and verify for yourself. With the understanding that 701 BC is 3136 after creation, we can now see that the year of the Exodus, 2458 after creation, is 1379 BC. The year of Joshua 510, 2499 after creation, is in fact 1338 BC. And of course, we understand that the year of 2 Kings 19.29, 3136 after creation, is 701 BC. You can now see that the year Aviv 2044 to Aviv 2045 will mark the end of history of mankind as we currently know it. As I will continue to prove to you, 1996 to 2045 is the final 70th Shabuah of Daniel. 
This is the time of the end and the last days spoken of by all of the prophets in which all prophecy must be fulfilled, including the abomination of desolation, great tribulation, and the return of Yeshua on the clouds. What I will show you in Bible Prophecy Secrets is there are three witnesses that tell us the exact timing of the end, and they are Moses, Daniel, and Jesus himself. Because the words Shane, Shabua, which is the same thing as weeks in Daniel's prophecy, and Genea all mean the same exact thing. Let me prove it to you. Go download Bible Prophecy Secrets for free. There's a link in the description below. And if you want to order a copy, you can order a copy as well. That said, again, my name's Abraham. Thank you so much for taking time to check this presentation out. And I'll catch you on the next one. And please, if you found this information to be helpful in your walk with God, we've got to share this message. The time of the end is truly here. We are in the 70th week of Daniel. We're in the 120th Shane of mankind. And we need to get God's people woken up. They need to wake up. They need to wake up out of their sleep. So let's do it. Let's do it together. And Jesus be with you. Yeshua be with you. And bless you and keep you in these last days.